Harvey, 911, what is your emergency? What's going on, ma'am? I'm dying, mademoiselle. Okay, let me transfer you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get uh, fire department online, okay? Hold on one sec, okay? Department. Ma'am, are you still there? Ma'am, are you still there? All I've got is she's telling me she's dying. I'm getting. I've got a. Why are you still there, ma'am? Ma'am, what is your address? Ma'am. I mean, it was, um, she was a very beautiful girl. Uh, she was very funny. <laughs> she liked to talk a lot. Sarah was a tomboy to a T. Um, she always wore jeans and sneakers. Amina was more of a social butterfly. She was very outspoken. She was very tomboyish too, but she also had that pretty cheek side to her, whereas Sarah was more of the tomboy, really reserved. They liked the school, they liked their friends, and they made her feel welcome. And then I remember her cell phone going off quite often, and the entire karate school would have to do lots and lots of push-ups for Miss Amina. Amina liked pink a lot. That was her signature color. If she could have put the world in pink, she would, she would have done that. They just were happy and just normal American girls, just very happy to be alive and very happy to have their friends. And I don't think I ever saw Sarah without a smile on her face. Uh, I met Amina through martial arts. I've always been into martial arts my entire life. And I was doing Taekwondo at the time. Ah! The instructor had me doing some kind of an exercise and she walked in and I was like, I messed up whatever I was doing because I was because there was a big mirror in the front of the room, so you could see every angle of the room every time. As soon as somebody walked in, you know, you could see it. And then she walked in. I think I was doing push-ups or something, and then I just I fell like, oh man, who was that girl? And I was I was immediately attracted to her. But the first thing I thought was like, man, no, a girl that beautiful. Of course she has a boyfriend, and it, like, you know, don't even. I didn't think there was anything that was ever going to come of it. I mean, I had met her boyfriend. <clears throat> in the karate schools, a young man named Joseph. I would describe it as your stereotypical young teenage love. Uh, they were together almost every day of the week. Like one time, class, had, class was just beginning, and I was taking my shoes off, you know, getting ready to go work out, basically. And I had my cell phone in my pocket, and I took it out, and I put it inside my shoe in the little cubby hole or whatever, and she saw me do that, and she was like, I didn't know you had a cell phone, and I was like, yeah. And she was like, well, let me get your number for something. I don't even remember what, and I, okay. Of course, I said yes, and, and that's, always, that's really the day that we really, really started, like, 
talking. We, we started texting back when texting was like first and new and cool. And, and I had no idea what I was doing. She would get mad because it would take me like 15 minutes to reply to like hi or something. I had no idea what I was doing, but I just, I don't know. It was, a, it was just a good feeling. When I first met Amina, actually my first thought was, I hope her and my son get along together. I think they kept it a secret that they were talking or starting to become close, but not too long after that, um, Joseph shared with me that he and Amina had started a relationship. We were just attracted to each other. I don't mean just physically, I mean on every level, we were just, we just connected and it didn't take much time for us to start a relationship, a serious relationship. And went from, hey, I like you to, I love you, and not very long. She told me the fact that I was so passionate about my music is one of the things that initially attracted her to me. She was the kind of person I could have had the worst day at school, maybe arguing with my mom or something, and within a minute of being around her, I, nothing else mattered. She just had a very strong presence about her. She, she was just one of a kind. Oh my God, I just realized I'm recording. This is my room. Well, mostly mine. It's partly Sarah's. And those are my, mine and Sarah's computers. And our bed. Oh, here's Sarah. Um, she's on the laptop. Let's see. Hey, Sarah. What are you doing? I'm looking for something. Sarah's a real sweet girl. Uh, she wasn't with me for as long. Uh, she didn't seem to uh, get in nearly as much trouble with me as Amina, uh, but both of the girls seemed to be real sweet all the time. She wanted to go to college. She wanted to go to, I believe, Texas Tech. I want to say, I can't recall which doctor it is, but she wanted to be a doctor. Sarah didn't really talk too much. I mean, she was very academic. That's all she really ever talked about. The few times that we did have relatively long conversations, she was always talking about school and how she wanted to do this. And I mean, they, they had plans for themselves. You know, that both Amin and Sarah definitely had future plans. You know, with Eric and Sarah, it was one of those puppy loves. It was very like youthful and beautiful. It was like blossom. Like they, you can tell as time went on, they would blossom to something serious. Sarah had a special spirit about her. And I think even you can see that spirit in photos of her. She just exudes something special and you just want to smile whenever you see her. And she was just like that in person. I met uh, the Sayed family. They worked at the uh, little convenience store next to our apartments. Yasser's the oldest of five kids, the brother that's a year younger than Yasser is Yushri, and then Yasin is right under Yushri, Mawson, which is the other brother, and then their sister Wada. I was 14 years old when I started dating Yasin. Whenever Yassine asked my dad to marry me, my dad said okay, that he would allow me to marry him and sign my papers. And then we broke up and then I started dating Yasser and then we got married. Yasser was 14 years older than I was. My dad said that my sister could marry Yasser because uh, at the time Yasser had convinced my dad that that he loved my sister and that his family had a lot of money and they could take care of my sister and treat her with respect. And my dad hesitated and said no, but my mom talked him into it, thinking that my sister would be taken care of. I don't think it was love. I think it was just, we were so poor, I just wanted to get out of the house. You know, he like promised everything oh, everything, you know, your life is going to be better. And I don't think I was in love. I think I grew to love Yasser. When I found out she was getting married, I, I had a little tantrum, you know. You know, I told her, well, you're running your life. You're too young. And 
she did it anyway, so. We went and applied for his green card soon after we got married. He also was here on a student visa. At first, it was good. He was loving six or seven months, maybe a year. It just started going downhill. He just like started wanting to have more control, did not want me to have anything to do with my family. We argued about it, but he always said because my family um, was Americans and that Americans wasn't very good. Well, of course it upset me. Yes, you know, so it would just say it was a mistake that he married American. When I was sleeping and he'd come in from work, he'd come and like kick the bottom of my feet or hit me to get me up. He would take stuff from the dresser drawers and go pour it all out in the middle of the floor and then make me sit there and clean it all up. He cut me on my leg because I wouldn't have intercourse with him. Islam was born first. I had him at 16. And then I had Amina at 17, and then I had Sarah at 18. She got pregnant right away, probably within a month. So within 10, 10 months of their marriage, she had Islam. After I had Islam, he started driving a taxi for a little bit. And then he did not work for a while, but mainly he would drive a taxi. Yeah, so was not faithful. He had six affairs that I know of. He has a daughter by um, another girl before we married that's about a year older than Islam is. Yasser came to the United States in 83, and before that, uh, he had got mad at one of his co-workers, and he had waited out in his Yasser's car. And when the guy came out, Yasser ran over him, and then Yasser ran over the guy like three different times, and uh, the guy ended up dying. And Yasser's dad paid a lot of money to get Yasser out of that. Okay, that's Aminu, Amina. Uh, let me let me see the supervisor here. Let me see. <laughs> Customer. They moved me out to supervisor today. Oh, that's great. How long have you been working there? Two and a half weeks. That's only and you make your supervisor? Yep. Wow. She's smart like her mother. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> All she really said was that her dad was strict and the more I mean, that's just any relationship. The more comfortable you get with the person, the more you start telling them really what's up. And she started telling me just little by little that it was more than just him being protective. It was more him being controlling and abusive. Um, she started sharing her true life story. I guess as time started passing, Joseph uh, felt the need to start sharing with me. And then that's how I grew to become, to know her on a more in-depth level. You know, I didn't really understand fully at the time until the relationship progressed. And as it progressed, you know, she would tell me more and more just horror stories about him, basically. My mom had called me. I was with my sister, Connie, and my mom called me and told me that Amina said that her dad had touched her. So the first thing that I did is I took him to Cook's Children's Hospital to get them examined, and we called CPS. My sister left uh, Yesser and was staying with my mom, and they contacted the police department, and uh, CPS was contacted, and the girls, they were talked to by CPS.
Both of the girls was claiming they were being abused. Both of them went to the hospital, and both of them got examined, and there was no evidence. I made the reports, and the police confronted him, took him in for questioning. He was upset because he was being accused of molesting his daughters. Um, yeah, sir started uh, calling my mom's house all hours of the night. The phone rung and rung and rung. He would call at one, two, three in the morning every 30 minutes. And, you know, we kept telling him, quit calling, quit calling. He made threats. Uh, we unplugged the phone because we couldn't get any sleep. He drove by my mom's house, made threats against my mom and dad. The police had said they were going to arrest him for uh, making a threat against my sister. Then Yesser was arrested for retaliation. Yesser didn't go to jail for that. Yesser went to jail for uh, tickets. And then they made the girls say that it didn't happen to keep him out of jail. The girls said that they were told to say that. My mom and sister Gail told them to say that. And then my mom had told them to, you know, say that their dad had touched them. The girls had told the authorities down there that the reason they wanted to drop the charges was that, um, that they had lied, they claimed they had lied, and that they, they just wanted to go live with their grandmother and they didn't want to live in Covington anymore. The decision to drop these charges caused a break in the family between Tizzy and the grandmother, um, Tizzy's mom. I mean, I wrote Connie a letter and said that they were made to lie and say that it never happened to keep their father out of jail. So I think, I think they both made the girls say it didn't happen. I mean, I... I uh, had wrote me a letter saying that, you know, mom wants us to say that, you know, my dad uh, didn't sexually abuse us until uh, social services, that it never happened. And in the letter she said, but I don't want to go back. I, please don't, you know, please don't make us go back. When my sister took the girls and left, I, uh, <laughs> I had the letter, I hid it in the closet in my bedroom. Now, my sister, me and my sister lived in the same house with my kids and her kids. And so when I hid the letter in the closet, I thought it would be safe there. I mean, I, I never figured uh, she would go in my room and search my room, but I think my sister, Amina told my sister she wrote that letter. And I believe my sister, uh, found the letter and took it because I, I couldn't find it anywhere. I never recalled hearing about a letter that Connie had. Connie took the letter to and contacted CPS and everything and told them. And once that CPS wanted to talk to Patricia, and once that Connie had told her that, then but while Connie was at work, uh, supposedly Patricia went in, found the letter, and took off with the kids again and went back to Yes, sir. Honestly, I don't think Yasser would abuse his daughters. When uh, my sister Patricia went back to Yasser, they took the kids and went to Maryland for about three or four months until everything quietened down in Texas. And then they took the kids and went to Egypt and stayed there a few months, and then they came back to Texas. Oh, I was... I was scared of yes, or and I was scared that he would go and harm my mom and my dad. She mentioned, you know, when they were younger about the uh, sexual abuse and how Patricia made them recant that, took them back to the household where the abuser was, which was their father, Yasser. Don't even think about it. Sarah sleep with her pants. 
Because that's for record action. People see how, how, how you sleep with your clothes. Man! Nice legs. <laughs> I got this. Mm. Take this blanket from this one in the back. No! Go. No! Get away! Take. No! Oh. Get out! Get the other one. Get out! We just need to figure. Mmm, very nice. <laughs> No, you can't. Yes, I will. Uh, Are you drunk? This is illegal. Do I videotape you and you're sleeping? Hey, get there. <laughs> wow, look at these eyes. I put my eye on you. I'm gonna get sick now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, turn it off, Dad. My mom would take uh, my younger sister to to Patricia's house and, and drop her off where she could help with Islam and the babysit. And it got to, after a couple weeks of her going over there, she would cry, no, I don't want to stay. Please don't make me stay. And uh, they just thought she's been, you know, that she's been lazy and didn't want to help. But that wasn't the real reason. It's because, yes, sir. Little Billy was real upset. And I guess she had went to the bathroom, was in the bathroom and Connie went in and talked to her and she told her that yes or miss with her. Connie went to her mother with it, but they were too afraid to just, you know, tell Donnie, Patricia's father. Nobody called the police. My mom was scared. Um, you know, they just thought they could handle it inside the family and not let my sister go over there anymore. Um, my mom didn't realize he was gonna do it to, you know, his own kids. I kind of heard bits and pieces of it, but I never heard the whole thing. Um, she was told about the abuse. Uh, you know, my my younger sister was crying because of the, uh, the abuse. And, you know, she says she asked him about it, and he said he didn't do it. Of course, he's going to say that. They never said why they didn't tell me back then. When Amina was 16, she was taken to Egypt. To, he was gonna marry her off to a 40-something year old man, and Amina refused. He was going to marry them off um, to what I refer to as the highest bidder in Egypt. Her father was introducing her to these men that were way beyond her years, that he was going to um, set up them a marriage for the girls, but Amina was the oldest, so she was going to be the first. He never said that he's gonna marry him off to Egyptian men. When Tessie lived in the same apartments I did back when the girls were little, it was right after Sarah was born, and I was over there, and she was telling me that, you know, the girls would have to grow up, they couldn't, marry Americans, and I said, well, why is that? And she said it was just their thing. They have something they, they have to marry, you know, Muslims they couldn't marry. I said, you know, if it was me, I'm gonna marry whoever I want to, whether they're Muslim or American. If I want to marry, I'm gonna marry who I want to. And she said, no, it won't work that way. He, they can't, the girls can't, they can't do that. Hey, Joey Fair. I'm gonna tell you a secret. Come here. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we had like we I mean, we had like a hundred plans with, but the most recent one that we were actually working on was just to get her out of the state. We were gonna go to Vegas and just have a trip, and we were gonna get married. Just to, I mean, why not? You know, it was a serious relationship. It we we were really in love with each other, and. 
I, I wanted to get her away from that so bad. She, she was such a good person. She didn't deserve to live like that. I had every intention to get her away from that and to marry her. I wanted her to be my wife. I wanted her to be my queen. And we were going to make it happen one way or another. They were going to get married, and we were going to do whatever it took. I was not going to leave her or my son alone. We were going to be there. My whole family stood behind them. We were, we were fearful, of course, but I wasn't going to let them go through it by themselves. We had to pick her up in the parking lot of the Taekwondo studio because we couldn't come to her house because her dad was there. She wouldn't really ever want to text things too intimate because she was always afraid of her dad finding the phone, finding my number, finding in anything. Yasser followed those girls everywhere. Even when she was in the Taekwondo studio, when she was driving herself with her car, she told my son they couldn't talk in the car because he had the car bugged. She was so afraid of Yasser, she would not even use a public telephone because she said he gets in everywhere, he knows everything. She can't see us from inside, right? Uh -uh. Huh? Uh -uh. She smiled to the customers. Baba, she has to, part of her job. She's in trouble. When Yasser uh, found out about Joseph, I believe she had written him a letter or um, something to that effect. And if I'm not mistaken, it had our home address because sometimes they would use the internet and then sometimes they would just, uh, she would like writing letters to him. I believe it was, because we used to write like little love notes to each other pretty much every day. When we would come to class, we would just trade notes with each other, you know. We'd, during the day at school or whatever, we would just write whatever we thought, and it, it became like a daily thing. And she told me that he had found one that I had written to her, or one that she was writing to me, and was asking her, you know, who is this for? Like, you know, what the hell is this? And she lied to him and told him that it was just made up, that in a perfect world where she could actually have friends and let alone have a boyfriend, that she was pretending and she was writing it to that guy, and that it wasn't to anybody real. And that's when she stopped going to Taekwondo because he moved him, like literally like overnight, just from one day to the next, she was just gone. And, and I, had, I had no idea like what happened. She literally just, from, I went from talking to her hours a day, every day, to just nothing. She just, she was just gone. He literally just uprooted them from one minute to the next. And we had already had fears because she had already um, given us indication that he would hurt her, kill her, or just send her off to Egypt. So we had no clue where Amina had gone. That was very hard. I, I mean, I, I didn't even know what to think. I, I mean, how do you deal with something like that? A short time after, she contacted Mr. Valdez, the instructor, via email and wrote what had happened, where she was at. And she had a message that she wanted to be given to my son, Joseph, so that he knew that she was okay. Um, Mr. Valdez um, contacted 
from Joseph's father, Kevin, and asked, what do we do with this information? And so that's how the letter came to me. I was thrilled, first of all, to know that she was safe and she was alive and she was still in the United States. I didn't tell Joseph that Amina about the letter or that she had contacted us. I quickly emailed her back and that's how Amina and I started becoming even closer. She told me that he wanted her to give the information of my son whereabouts because he wanted to go after my son and she said he wanted to kill him but she said that she didn't say anything and that her father had beat her where you couldn't tell her braces from her lips yes they're kicking her in the mouth and she had braces and supposedly her her lips were embedded they said into her braces woke her up by kicking her in the stomach and then kicking her in the face uh, splitting her lips open uh, because of her braces. She did not have braces. Yes, sir, and Amina was not fighting. Yes, sir, wasn't abusive toward the kids. It, it was just me that he was abusive to. He was a good dad. He loved his kids. Uh, as her mom was driving her to the hospital, Amina stated that she received a phone call from the uncle stating that she should not take Amina to the hospital. So then Amina was then returned back home. So mom did know about the abuse going on. Her last trip to Egypt, she was so afraid to go. She knew that he wasn't gonna let her come back. We were trying to figure out a way to maybe make her sick or something to prevent her from going. She was so scared. Amina gave me all her information, social security. She wanted for me to find out information that if her father took her passport, how she could return. So she ended up going. And while she was there, she, I guess, went to an internet cafe or something. She emailed me very briefly, telling me that something was really wrong because shortly after they got there, their father had taken their American passport. So she told me she would try to contact me again. And um, I didn't hear from her. As soon as they got back to the States, she, con Amina contacted me and let me know she was back. All of this, again, was my son Joseph had no knowledge. Just his father, Kevin, and I were sharing this information um, because, again, the safety of, of all involved, I wanted to make sure that we were trying to at least be somewhat level-headed because I didn't want anything to happen because I believed everything that she told me. Most of our emails were about my son Joseph, her love for him, the concern for him and his safety. That was her number one priority, to keep him safe. I give him her information because she really wanted to email him and talk to him and, and see him again. And then we started talking again and, you know, we realized everything that we felt was still there and just because things had gotten a little crazy that there was no reason to give up on it because we both felt like what we had was very real and it was very, very much worth fighting for. And to her, it was worth dying for. After they got back in contact again, um, Joseph and Amina did, it was, um, we had to be very careful, extremely careful, 
Joseph was concerned for her safety just as much as I was. She was often calling out of desperation, wanting out of the situation. She did not want to live anymore. She tried to commit suicide and they took her to the hospital. They had counselors and people talking to her and I asked her why she couldn't share these things with people because hopefully we could get help for her. And she said that um, it didn't work that way. Because she was a minor, anything that she shared was gonna have to be told to her parents and it would be worse for her at home. My heart, an open wound. I can only cry. Don't try to understand. Make me a bird, let me fly. I hate you, I hate your land. You've frozen my heart, let me die. My pain you will never know. Make me a leaf, let me fly. Blow, blow, blow. We were at dinner, Christmas dinner, and um, Joseph got a message. He told me she finally did it. She just didn't want to be under her dad anymore, and that her and Sarah basically had, had enough, and they wanted a chance at a real life, so they left. And I asked him if she were safe, did we need to go get her, or where was she at, and he said she would let us know. My sister called me, um... I guess it was a couple days before Christmas and said that Yeser had threatened to uh, kill Amina because she was dating an American boy. She was afraid for the girls' lives and everything. She was leaving and she was coming to my house. My Aunt Jill, she lives in Kansas and we had went over there. Eddie and Eric, they came along with us, with me and Amina and Sarah. So when I opened the door and they come in, the first thing TC said was uh, the girls were gonna run away with their boyfriends, but she could not let that happen. So Amina, she spoke up and she told me, she says, yes. She says, my mom said that she always wanted to leave my dad, so we let her come with us. And the girls were talking about how, how he beat the girls, and especially Amina, how he would beat her and, and stuff like that. I said, Patricia, what if uh, you decide to go back to Yeser because you've gone back to him so many times? And she said, Jill, there's no way I could ever go back to him. She said, if I do, he will definitely kill the girls. Yeser and Islam both filled out a police report, a missing person report on, on Patricia, Sarah, and Amina. And the, the Louisville police wanted to talk to Patricia, make sure they were all okay, everything was fine. And um, Patricia said that she would call them in the, the next day or two. And I asked her several times, are you sure you don't want to call and let them know that you're okay? And she said, no, I'll call them tomorrow or the next day. She didn't, wouldn't call them from my house. At one point we sat down to eat and um, we was going to have some Mexican food, and I didn't have, I didn't have enough chips for the salsa. So Patricia said she'd go up to the store, and she took all four kids and loaded them in the in the vehicle. They all run up to the store a couple blocks. She wouldn't leave, let the any of them stay there while she was going to the store. They all left the house and went to get the bag of chips. And then whenever they come back to the house and they come in, that as soon as they walked in, Patricia informed me they'd be going to Tulsa. We were at Jill's maybe, maybe three hours. And um, it, she just, it just wasn't the place to be. She knew the first thing that the father would try to do was try to track them from their cell phone. So 
you know, they did break the SIM cards and they discarded with those phones. And after they left, they got another one from, you know, some small carrier and they were talking on that phone. And that's, that's how I kept in contact with her during that time. When I found out Patricia was with the girls, I knew that was a big mistake. Patricia had told the police that she was afraid of Yasser and that she had taken the girls and she was not coming back. Connie called me and told me she had talked to Patricia and that they had they had the apartment, that they had Tessie was starting to work on Monday. I talked to my nephew, uh, Islam first, and Islam was upset. He wanted his mom and his sisters to come home and he missed them and I told him I didn't know where they were and uh, yes, sir. got on the phone and he said that he really missed Tissy and the girls and she, he wants them to come home. And so when I hung up the phone, yes, sir, I called my sister and told her that, you know, he was trying to say that he wanted them to come home, but, and I told her it's a trick, just don't go back, just stay away. And she said she wasn't going back at that time. Eddie had a disc jockey, DJ job. So he had to come back, he had two more days of that, and he was gonna come and do that, and then he was going back. We would call and check our messages where you can call the number and put your pen in, and we'd hear the messages. Yasin kept calling the mobile phones and leaving, text, uh, leaving voicemails and then sending uh, emails to Amina and the voicemails to my phone and Amina's phone saying that just to go back home, it was our house, not to leave. We were exchanging text messages, you know, like we always had, and she was just telling me that she was very worried because her mom was having second thoughts and she wanted to go back home to the father. She told me she wanted to come back because she felt guilty for abandoning her husband, I guess. Even though the situation completely made sense. Why? I mean, any, any normal person, any remotely responsible parent could have understood that, but somehow this person, if you want to call her that, felt that turning on her own children was the correct thing to do. I have emails saying the type of mother Patricia was not. She didn't understand how a mother could not be behind her children, how a mother could be more for the father, and what he wants. We called Yassim because of all the messages and emails he was leaving. Yassim was uh, being nice and said that if we didn't want Yasser there, then they would make him leave. And then after talking to him, then that's when we called Yasser after talking to Yassim. Uh, actually, it was Sarah that was talking to Yasser first. And then I spoke to Yasser, and then Amina spoke to Yasser, and that was it. And we agreed on coming back, going back to Texas. agreed to go back to keep the problems down, and they didn't even tell Amina they were, they were going back. Amina said that she hated him, she hated her father, and that she would never go back. She, her, the both girls, they said that, that they would never go back to Texas. I believe that there is no way that Amina would have came back to Texas thinking she was going back home. Amina said that uh, my sister Patricia and and uh, so I had told her that she was gonna come back and stay at my house and put uh, flowers on my mom's grave for her birthday and they were gonna stay for New Year's and that's why they were coming back to Texas. When in fact, I never knew they were coming back to Texas. 
they get back, and I guess somewhere along the way, Tizzy admits that she's going back to Yasser. And once she got him down there, then she informed them she was going back to their father. And that's when Amina got so upset. Um, Amina says, I'm not going home. I'm not, I'm not going back there. And so she goes to Eddie's house, and that's where she stays. I had already told her that she could uh, go to stay the uh, not at Rosemary's house, which was her friend's, uh, and had the cookout with her friend's family. And so Sarah and I went back home. I made a, spent the night there because she refused to go home. Sarah went with Patricia in her car. Patricia went back to Yesser. Amina refused to, as she took the truck and she went back to Eddie's. I got a phone call from Amina on uh, December 31st. She was kind of yelling at me at first and she said, uh, Aunt Connie, did you know Mom went back to my dad? And I was like, well, wait, hold on, because she was kind of upset. And I said, what? And she said, did you know my mom went back to my dad? And I'm like, no, I didn't know. I've been trying to call. I can't get in touch with anyone. The cell phone number, you know, y'all gave me that I was calling. I can't get through on it. I mean, it was very scared because, I mean, she, she knew what that meant. Once her mom went back, she was going to tell yes or everything. And, and that was pretty much the end of their run. And uh, she said, well, my mom went back to my dad, and my mom said that, you know, she was going to come to Texas to uh, visit, you know, my grandma's grave. And I said, well, I don't know. I haven't heard from her. She said, uh, Mom and, and Sarah went back, and she said, I'm never going back. Um, uh, I'd rather die before I go back. Why did she leave the girls in Tulsa then? Why did she lie to them? Why did she make them come back? We were text messaging, you know, for me to come to her, to get away, to get away from her father. And she said, what should I do? And I said, go down and file a restraining order and go as far away as you can. And she said, OK. Tizzy begins, begins to beg Amina to come home. She begins calling and begging. Starting at eight something in the morning, there's a text message from Sarah for Amina to call her mother. So when Amina called, Tizzy was wanting her to come home. And Amina told her no, she was not going home. She told her mother Patricia she was not going home. And Patricia kept on. Uh, she, Amina called for me to come pick her up on the next day or the day after they were going back to school, so she wanted to get her school stuff ready. All day, there was nothing but phone calls. Patricia kept making phone calls to Amina, and Amina kept telling her no, because her dad was gonna kill her, and she didn't want to go home. She would rather die first. And I remember just telling her no, like, that that was a horrible idea just to stay gone. Just, I mean, if you can't, trust your mom and you know what your dad is like, what? And she told me that she had to do what she had to do. And she loved me. Patricia just kept on and on until finally, when Patricia saw she wasn't getting through to Amina, she went over there. That's when Patricia told her to hurry up that they were running out of time. And she finally convinces uh, Amina to come back to the house. So I went and picked her up from her friend's house, and we went home. The officer said that he wanted to take them out to dinner and talk with them.
There were chilling final words from a 17-year-old girl who was bleeding to death with her sister in a taxi cab near Dallas today. Those words, oh my God, I'm dying. They are Amina and Sarah Saeed. They were both shot over and over and left to die outside Irving, Texas in a hotel on New Year's Day. Now police want to find Yasser Saeed. Yasser Abdel Saeed, a taxi driver accused of murdering his two daughters last night and leaving their bodies in his cab at an Irving hotel. Who would, who would think that their father would kill them? It was the day that I was supposed to return to work from Christmas break. And I was asleep in my bed and my mother came into my room and she was just bawling, just... And, and she woke me up and she was like, I have to tell you something horrible. And I told him that Amina, the Yasser had shot and killed Amina and Sarah. Of course I didn't believe it. And she told me that it was all over the news. And I remember him sitting up and he shot, he got a fist and he slammed it into the, the wooden headboard that on his bed. Then our hell started, telling him what happened to Amina was probably one of the worst days of my life. How do you tell your child that the love of his life is no more? It was hard to say the least. I mean, I've known people that died before, but when it's the person that means more than anything in the world to you, I mean, how do you deal with that? I literally went on to the government remote control, turned on the TV, Channel 5 was on, and their pictures pulled up, and I was just like bawling, crying, because I, I couldn't believe it. Like, it was just so surreal. I was shocked that Tessie would let yes or be able to get the girls. It's just, it was a devastating time for all of us, and it's, we're going back in time and remembering it's very difficult. They ended up having to take me to the hospital where they take people that are severely depressed or are trying to treat them for, for grief or for whatever. I mean, I mean, they had me locked in this room, you know, with all these like other crazy people basically. And they were pumping me full of all these medicines and you know, all this stuff, just trying to get me to, to calm down, to come back to reality. Cause I, I wasn't hearing anything from anybody. The only person that could speak to me was my mother. I mean, I lost my grip on reality for, for more than a little while. Um, it was just, it was just a rough time. I don't, I don't even know the words to explain. I remember my son telling me about the promise that Amina made him make, and that was the day that her father would murder her, that he would promise that he would never hurt himself. For years, it was a daily battle. The fact that I could get out of bed and go brush my teeth was an accomplishment in itself. Well, now for the first time, the FBI says this may have been an honor killing, something the family believed all along. Honor killing is the murder of typically a female, usually by a male relative, for perceived transgressions against traditional gender norms, uh, including promiscuity, disobedience, even uh, for being raped. The shame that the family feels because of the woman's behavior causes them to kill her to restore the honor. Honor killings occur in the traditional societies of the Middle East, the Indian subcontinent, North Africa, and immigrant communities worldwide, including in Europe and the USA. In much of the Muslim countries, um, tribal law is really what's in effect. And actually, the messenger, peace be upon him, is narrated to have said, uh, leave it, it is rotten, in referring to tribal law and referring to tribal allegiance. The killer not only has the support of the family, the killer is supported by the family and the community. 
they have to do this in order for the family to restore their honor and their standing in the community. Very often the family would be shunned and not be able to even make a living and hold their head up and make eye contact with anyone in the community. They do it for the sake of the relatives, the community, the people around them so they don't feel ashamed and people are not talking about him. And he did an honor thing. Um, and people would just praise him actually. Statistics of honor violence are notoriously unreliable because so many of them are not reported or investigated. The UN believes there is about 5,000 per year worldwide. Uh, women's advocacy groups estimate that it's probably closer to 20,000 a year. There are 800 million women and girls living in the honor killing zone. And I believe that's how many women and girls live under oppressive patriarchal cultures where many of their choices are not their own and they could be injured or killed by their families if they fail to toe the line. Police recorded this phone call with Noor's mother shortly after her husband ran over their daughter and her boyfriend's mother. At one point during the call, Noor's mother defended her husband's actions. Your daughter is about close to dying. Close to die? Yes, she's in critical okay. condition. Tell her thank you, Amal, thank you. That's what she needs. She needs to protect this family. That's what we need. You're a sick individual. The mothers of the honor killing victims are as vulnerable as their daughters are. They very often aid and abet the honor murderer in order to save their own lives. There is no such thing in the Quran, there is no such thing in the Hadith that is called honor killing. Uh, Islam does not condone that. Actually, this is nothing but murder. Islam never gives a person the right to execute or uh, the punishment by their own selves. Um, I could never justify how or why. Like, is he religious? He wasn't. Because even sometimes religion will play a big role in it. But he wasn't. You find in most of these uh, so-called honor killing, the mother and the father are not really religious. They really don't even know what God is, have not prayed, anything like that. But they're Muslims. Yasser wasn't a particularly religious man. He didn't go to the mosque every week. He wasn't, he, he didn't strike anybody as particularly devout. But he did not want his daughters dating Western American people. He, he felt they were too westernized. And so clearly, I think he felt that they had, were culturally becoming too American. So that's what the dad wanted. The dad wanted him, maybe his kids to be a copy of him. Before Islam, before the Quran, before the Hadith, before this person even worries about what God wants, what kicks in his tradition is the society, acceptance, how is he going to show his face in front of people, etc. And that's what drives these people to do what they do. Sometimes culture overrides religion in a lot of ways. For them thinking that they are the same, try to, to kind of convince themselves they're the same, but they're not. So yes, that's what happens. Um, it's it's the, the culture, the practices that, that, that people are doing in the name of religion. Honor killing is not sanctioned by Islam or Islamic law, but there are elements in it that definitely make women and girls more vulnerable to honor violence, such as having their rights and freedoms curtailed, having their sexuality controlled, and having to obey their husbands. Um, no, Islam really was very, very fair. Give, give me all the rights that I needed. Honor violence is a community-supported form of terrorism against half of a culture's population in order to reinforce the system of male power and privilege. In any religion, right, you have man's hand all over these, these uh, you know, scripture, these teachings, and, and man's interpretation, and man's uh, uh, drivers, driving forces, which is always, uh, you know, tyranny, uh, uh, want to deprive others of their rights because it's good for me, right? That's, that's basically the dominant theme of men throughout history. And so because of that, uh, there's an accumulation of ignorance over the years. And today, we have people who are completely have no idea what is left, whether it is good or not anymore. It's important to be very clear on the difference between domestic violence and honor violence. And I think part of the problem is not understanding the difference, but also it's the fear of being labeled racist or culturally insensitive or politically incorrect to label a murder 
and honor killing. A lot of times we are guilty in the Muslim community in general that people don't want to talk about these things and these things tend to be taboo. We have to call it what it is or it's not going to be handled properly. And actually we need to be more proactive and not wait until the next event happens and then it's all over the media and by then you're kind of fighting a flood. Uh, instead, you should, be, uh, you should go everywhere and uh, that you have a contact with people and educate them. The United States police forces definitely need to learn about honor violence. There are organizations that are training them in that. The way that law enforcement handles honor killing cases in the honor killing zone is very inconsistent. It depends on the culture, the religion, the tradition, who the victim is, who the family is that perpetrated it. Is it reported? Is it recorded as an actual case? Does it go to court? There are many factors in how it's handled. We had a, a Christian ceremony for the girls and a Muslim ceremony. Funerals are always very emotional events, but there was a different sort of tension at this funeral. You had a true division going on. Friends of the girls being very upset by what had happened to them, and then you had Yasser's family there as well. It was, a, it was one of the most tense uh, funerals I've ever attended. They were both buried in, a, in pink caskets with pink um, roses in their hair. And it was really, it was, it was so tragic. When I had saw Amina and Sarah's body, I was very surprised. Like, it seriously was true that all this had happened. And, like, I'm not going to ever see them again. And, you know, it, it's reality. It, it really hurt. And so we went to the viewing. And that's, that's really when, when all the what is, all the hope just, just died. I mean, I knew it was real and it was final. And all the rage in the world couldn't, couldn't reverse it. I was sitting as close as I could in front of Amina, which was the second row from, from the casket. And her brother, I didn't even realize at the time, he was sitting right directly in front of me. And he turned around for whatever reason. And he kind of like, you know, kind of did a double take. Like he instantly recognized me. And he was like, he was like, aren't you Joseph? And I, of course I recognized him and I already knew it was gonna be a deal, a big deal. And I told him, yes. And he stood up and he was like, you get the fuck out of here right now. You don't belong here. You did this. Those are his exact words to me. There was definitely some kind of confrontation between Islam and another individual. He was yelling and he was screaming at this person to leave. It wasn't like he escort, you know, escorted him. He just said, it'd be best if you left at this time. You know, we were about to fight. And the next thing you know, there's like four dudes around me and they all have their hands on me and say, hey, they asked you to leave, you gotta go, you gotta go. And then they had me there against the wall and they were asking me all these dumbass questions. Like, do you know where he is? And you know, did you have any involvement in this? And just, just stupid shit. It, it was just very unfortunate that he reacted the way he did. And at the actual cemetery, he was very mellowed. He was just, it was like, he really didn't know what was going on. Like he really wasn't there. The girls is buried in Muslim cemetery. That was my choice. The Muslim cemetery was very dark and all the grass was dead. There wasn't any flowers. It was awful. I begged my sister not to leave them there. She talked about her uncles. She said they were just as evil as he was and that should anything ever happen to Yasser that 
one, if not all of them, would intervene and take over his place. I do think the Saeeds know exactly where Yasser is. I think that uh, that the Saeed, uh, one of the Saeed brothers, uh, helped uh, Yasser get a, get away from the crime scene. How can you shoot? Uh, a young lady uh, twice in the chest and one nine times and have that much blood on you and walk away from a crime scene without nobody seeing you. Somebody picked him up. And then he's gone. He clearly would have had to have a plan on how to get out of town. I mean, who picks him up? Does he have a car there at the Omni Mandalay? How does he get away from there? Because a cab is left there. Somebody picked him up and no stranger's gonna pick up somebody with that much blood on them. I think the Saeeds know where Yasser is. I think the Saeeds are protecting Yasser. They're part of it. If you hired something like this, and if you know your partners, even my religion, Islam, you're, 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 you're doing the same thing too, because you cannot hide a criminal. Usually said that I was lucky that Amina Sarah's bodies was found for me to bury because if it was his daughters, that nobody would have found their bodies. All of Yasser's girls have been taken to Egypt and they set the marriage up. After the funeral, Tessie moves in with Moss and Yasser's brother. I thought that it would be easier for Islam to be around somebody that he knew. So we moved in with Moss and Mary and their kids. It was okay at first. And then they started making comments. And he said that Yasser didn't want to raise whores for daughters. She had herself convinced that um, it was Yasser that pulled the trigger and shot her kids, and that Mawson didn't have anything to do with it. However, he made a call to his brother Mawson and uh, talked to him right after he shot the girls. Mawson's wife said that Yasser called, and she told him that Mawson was in the shower. Yasser told Mary to tell Mawson to meet him at Denny's, their old place. Mary says he did not go out to meet Yasser, but she would lie for Mawson. I believe Mawson was in on it. I believe that Mawson helped him. Oh, hi. Thank you, Father, Mr. and Mrs. Saeed. Yeah, they're here. OK. Uh -huh. Is it possible to speak to them? Um, my name is Mina. Mina from? Well, I'm doing a project. Um, I'm doing a documentary about Amina and Sarah. I'm pretty sure they're not interested. We're good. OK. We're better. Staying away from everything, we choose to say nothing. We've been like that since day one. Right. We're gonna stay like that. I think we're good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, though.
Yasser is closer to Yassin than he is to any of his brothers. Anything that ever happened, like our arguments or anything, he always would call Yassin and tell Yassin what was going on. I think his brother Yassine helped him escape. He has two driver's licenses, one for Texas and one for New York. Why does he need both if he lives in New York? Why would Yassine need to have another car here in Texas, registered in Texas, and when he's got one registered in New York too? I've asked the police over and over why they haven't questioned Yassine, and all I get is they have their reasons. that his sister is wanted by law enforcement too because she kidnapped her kids and moved back to Egypt. The courts give the husband custody of the kids and she went home and packed a couple of outfits and diapers and Yassine took her to Canada and she stayed there for about a year and then from Canada she went to Cairo, Egypt. seen Iman and Yusuf in Egypt. Well, I did not report them, but after Amina and Sarah was murdered, I told the Irving Police Department and the FBI. Hi, Wait, Miss. now we are, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, Amina and Sarah, me and brother. Um, I got a TV, uh, I just wanna show you all, you're nice. Yeah. Okay, yeah, let's show them the TV. Yeah, and he likes me more than y'all, so. Um, this is my house, and it looks real nice. Mm -hmm. And I'm, gonna, I'm about to put uh, new tiles and stuff on the floor. Islam was more of a mama's boy, and the girls was more of a daddy of uh, daddy girls. The relationship Islam had with his sisters was very close. They, all three of them, Amina, Sarah, and Islam, they were very close, and you could tell that they spent a lot of time together. And they were very overprotective. They were very caring, very passionate about their brother. They just want to check on him all the time. They want to see how he's doing, and they want to help him, and they just check on him. They were so sweet. Islam was always so good little brat. He was just always uh, so different from the girls. The girls minded, they behaved, they would sit there, they had manners. As they, uh, more or less, they let him do what he wanted to do. Yes, sir. I uh, treated Islam a lot different from what I've been told. The boys in the Muslim family are very uh, respected. He did come off a little bit socially awkward and um, didn't know social cues for certain things. Um, you know, there was some times where in a situation it just wouldn't be okay and either, you know, he would throw a fit or he would get really angry. Um, you know, there, there was just something there. He wasn't all there. My sense of it was that Islam was, felt that the girls had some role in what happened to them. I mean, that was just kind of the sense I got from him, that he felt like 
they had driven their father to what had happened. You know, he couldn't believe his dad would do that, and he was very confused, and he blamed it on the two boys. Um, I talked to Islam a couple of times um, early on. Um, Islam was always very adamant that, um, at one point he was adamant that uh, his father should turn himself in. Um, at another point, he was thought he was, he said he was probably dead. Dad, just turn yourself in, and if, you know, if you do, I'll get you a lawyer to help you out. Uh, maybe they won't put you on death row, but uh, you can sit in prison and think about what you've done. At the vigil is when Islam got upset and he grabbed a mic from either one of the uh, newspaper people or TV people, and he started, you know, hollering in the mic. I remember Islam just randomly just said something crazy, like, he, my father didn't kill them. He just blurted out things that were just like, that made you think twice, like, what's going on? Like, what is going on with this family? Like, what's going on? Islam made that comment that the girls deserved what they got. Mawson and Mary had called and said that they were going to cook dinner and wanted Islam to go over there to eat with them and spend a little time with his cousins. So I said, okay. A couple of hours later, I got a phone call that Islam was on the airplane to Egypt. Islam was in Egypt for about three years. He's been trying to get back. The brothers wouldn't let him come back because all the threats that he's made toward family members and stuff on the internet, so they were scared for him to come back. There was something on the internet that Gail had put out there, and Islam got upset, so he called, and he was shouting on the answering machine, but Islam never went so far as to, on that call, to threaten her. I think Islam was a year old in that picture. I don't feel right when, when people do that. I mean, I feel very offended when they um, put this in their kid's hand. So that's, that's, that's not common for a parent to do it here, or that's not common for a parent to uh, even take a picture with it. I don't know where was the wife, because if, if it was me, and I'm Arabic, and I'm not American, I know how Americans feel about it, I would not take it. I would not accept it. You're teaching your child violence right there. You're feeding him violence. I didn't even know about that picture until after the girls died. Tissy. What? What are you doing? I'm playing a game. Uh, this is my, my gun my dad got me for my birthday. No, I didn't give it to you. Well, That's my gun. Me. He's giving it to me, you know, he's just Stop saying. Stop lying. Uh, this, this is my gun. My dad's gun, and I'm going to show you how to unload it. Push this button, and there's a magazine, and here's bullets. To it. So, okay. and when you're ready to fire, when you're ready to put it in there, you load it and you push this back. But I don't want to do that because I'm not ready to fire. <laughs> so. 
Um, I've tried to call Mawson a couple of times to get in touch with Islam, uh, but just uh, it was short, and where's Islam? And basically, that was it. Islam said he doesn't want to have anything to do with me, that I was the reason that his dad killed Amina and Sarah because I had left Yasser. I think he's, he knows where his dad is. I don't know if Islam's with Yasser or not. I haven't seen him since 08, Islam, and I haven't seen Yasser since 08 after he shot the girls. He knows something. He really knows something that we don't know. And is the truth going to come out? I don't think so, but it's just a matter of time. I honestly feel that it's just going to be so long after this, you know, maybe 10, 20 years from now that eventually someone's going to say something about what really happened. I'm not sure why um, the police didn't question Islam or Patricia um, or why they didn't ask um, Eric and Eddie other questions, you know, Patricia's involvement, Islam's involvement, what transpired, why did they come back? I, I don't, it's, it's sad to know that. The police department really never questioned them on what happened during the time that the four days and the end of the day, all the, the week before. Police department really didn't seem interested in interviewing anybody, but the, they uh, talked to the boys for several hours down into another room. I believe that the police department um, could have done a lot more on uh, uh, talking to the Saeeds to try to find out where, he, where he's at. I'm not happy with the investigation from the Irving Police Department. I think the, I think law enforcement should get more involved to, tra to trace and find out where Yasser is. I think if they got more involved in the Saeeds that they would lead him, lead the law enforcement to Yasser. I don't think the Army Police Department cares. I don't think they're trying to solve this case. Sarah had called 911, and she was letting the operator know that she had been shot and that she was dying. And the operator um, put her on hold several times, which I don't believe that's protocol in a priority one call. What's going on, ma'am? I'm dying, not my daughter. Okay, let me transfer you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get, uh, fire department online. Okay, hold on one sec. Okay. Ma'am, are you still there? Ma'am, are you I think the police was looking for him, and I think that they were getting, supposedly they were getting different things from different areas, and he, you know, he was in the cab until he parked that cab, and they couldn't get the correct area right where they was. That's why I think the police department had a hard time. Yeah, what I've got so far, you know, with me, I see. Yep. I'm getting Riverside and Mambolita, so it's going to be somewhere northeast of Riverside and Mambolita. 
Bam, can you hear me? I retransmit it now. I'm getting Jamestown and Monticello Drive. I'm redoing it and seeing what I get because I still shoot off of Riverside. Hello? I have no warrant. Hello? Hello? Uh, I just heard a car door open. Hello? They had tracked the phone to Tusi's house. The police had went and picked up Patricia and was taking her to the Irving Police Department. At that time, they hadn't, the police hadn't found the girls. Nobody knew anything else. When the police come to the house and said what happened, I said, they're in a taxi. Call Yellow Cab and get the GPS. And it took them an hour for somebody else to call the Albany Hotel to give the location of Amina and Sarah's bodies. Having 911, Coach, what's your emergency? Uh, my name is... We have a cab in our cab stand. It doesn't appear that there's a driver, um, but there are two people inside the cab, one in the uh, passenger seat and one in the rear of the vehicle. Uh, one of the people in the in the passenger seat looks like she's hunched over, and she has blood coming from her ear. She looks, she does not look like she is breathing. It doesn't look like they're alive to me. I understand that. We've got our officers in route. Hey. I believe urban police department's really doing anything on this case. I think this is one case that they're letting go cold and they don't want to. Well, I see that with Patricia. That's a very obvious with Patricia Said. She tells the urban police department that she come back because she felt guilty about leaving her husband. The day after the murders, Detective Henny, they told her that she needed to go to Louisville to her home, that the SWAT team was there. They let Patricia go in. They told her she could come in and she could take, you know, the things that she needed. Patricia went in. She took a computer. She took a box of important papers with, yes, there's birth certificate and stuff in it. She took a box with pictures and all. And uh, she took a box that had video camera tapes, video tapes from a video camera. That's what she took from the house. I would like to hope and think that the police department or investigation or detectives or FBI or whoever's researching this is trying to rectify those mistakes or errors or whatever you want to call them. My sisters and the other aunt Gail had put out flyers and stuff and were standing on the street corner passing them out and Tissy was real upset about it. She didn't want that happening. She didn't want Yesser's picture out there. She went as far as even going to the Irving Police Department and asked in the Irving Police Department to make to make them stop. And the police department told her, told Patricia that they had the right to do that. She didn't want Yesser's picture out there. She wanted to go on with her life. They had already said, Patricia and, and Islam had already said to, to leave things alone. They wanted to go on with their life. Detective Hennick, he told me that he knew that Patricia lies and he knows that she's got something died, but and that's when he, you know, he didn't say anymore. Um, and then we saw the uh, mom on Fox News, I believe, uh, when she was interviewed, um, basically saying that uh, she wanted to, you know, find the dad and they were going to hunt him down and find them. And then later on, uh, seeing the mom on another interview saying how sweet uh, and caring and kind the father was and how he could never do such a horrific thing. 
there are photographs of Yasser Saeed holding a knife to your throat. He told me he did that, that if I ever loved him or I disobeyed him, this is what I have to look forward to. At that time, he wasn't really being aggressive or anything. We were, it was just like, it was mainly for fun, the, uh, with him doing the picture with the knife. There are other pictures of you dressed up and holding guns. It was, it was like a rifle. He forced me to put that stuff on. Oh, that, we were like just joking around, taking pictures. Like, we went and like, he wasn't serious or anything on that. When we left, we took our Sims cards out of our cell phones and we broke them in half and threw them in the trash. We called from the prepaid phone from Tulsa. I did not call Yasser. I, uh, I had talked to Yassin uh, one time. That's when we called Yasser after talking to Yassin. Alhamdulillah, I am Muslim. I'm a Christian. I would have no idea the true reason as to why she changed her story. The only thing that I could speculate is maybe the father contacted her and told her to change his story. I felt that maybe Patricia had something to do with the murder, or maybe she was somehow not there when something with the things were going on, or she had to go by what you know uh, Yasser said. I, I mean, I'm not sure, but something's not right in this picture. Patricia set them up, the girls, Amina and Sarah. So I guess that's the way she honored them by having them murdered. I did a petition for Irving Police Department to arrest Patricia Said for her role in her daughter's murders. Patricia was arrested for fraud back years ago whenever the kids were small and she was, had gotten arrested for uh, marijuana, you know, smoking pot. And from the police report, it says Tissy gets out of the car and she's knocking uh, the pot off of her shirt and stuff and telling the officer that she don't know who it belongs to, it's not hers. But she's knocking it off of her shirt. Well, I mean, we were very close, I thought. We saw each other almost every day. Some of the things that I found that she'd been telling me over the years um, started to ring untrue with some of her actions. And I started actually to investigate and found that she had been lying to me about some things. I don't even know if anything that she's told me about his family is true. I'm still having trouble separating out what was truth and what was fiction. I don't recall who they were. It might be from where we were selling the puppies. We had put a, a ad on in the newspaper and online to sell the puppies. So those calls could be from that, from selling the dogs, the puppies. I don't know anybody by the name of Gregory. I haven't take a polygraph. It's just gonna be a waste of my time.
without being suspicious. This is the closest that you can get. There's really not easy access to the house and to continually drive by, it would be very suspicious and there really is no outlet. Um, there's just a way in and a way out. So I was driving up the road here on the street and I was passing the house and there's really, there's only really one way to go and I saw a man standing there in the, at the end of the driveway at the beginning of the, of the street. Um, it was dusk, but as I passed the man standing, we had eye contact. I knew it was him, um, very tall. Dark. It was cold, so he had a cap over his head, but he still had his mustache. I don't think he ever left the States. I believe he's been here the whole time. I believe he's in Texas. Um, I believe that his uh, family's helping hide him. I don't know where at though, but I do think he's in Texas. One thing Amina always said is that he loved the States too much, he would never leave. And that because she always knew this was gonna happen to her, she said that he had friends in the underground and that uh, they would help hide him, or he knew people, or maybe it's his family helping him, maybe that's who she meant. She was very evasive when it came to telling too much about that situation. She just wanted to have happiness. She wanted to have love and she wanted to be loved. And then the household that she was, she never experienced that. But I'm grateful for the time that we had with her because she knew what family was, she knew what unconditional love was, and she knew what true love was because she got that from my son and her relationship. And she was willing to sacrifice everything for that love and ultimately did. Again, her number one priority was to keep Joseph safe and out of harm's way from her father. She did everything possible to do that, and she implemented a plan to completely erase Joseph from their perspective. We had a set plan and had somebody else pretend to be taking my spot just so no heat would come back on me. So when she came to be with us, Joseph would not be the first person that they would go looking at. So the last six months of her life, that's what she did. She started erasing him but they were still very much involved and they were going to be married. She already had a ring and everything that they were planning on getting married. He had already asked her. With the friends that they left with, everybody presumed that that was her boyfriend. When the news started showing the coverage and they're pushing this guy, Eddie, it frustrated me because I felt like I was the only one that knew what was really, you know, what really happened, the truth. He knew and he was aware of it, and, and that's, I mean, that was the plan from the beginning. To me, that validated her sacrifice because she kept my son safe. A couple of days before her murder, she posted on her um, page that she did not want to become a memory. She'll never be a memory. She'll always be a part of our lives. I'm on my way to the gravesite of Amina and Sarah. I've never been there before.
I love you. Watches <laughs> <laughs> and pink flowers. I miss you. I wish you were still with us. <laughs> You're never going to be a memory. You're always going to be alive. <laughs> In our hearts. And those people can't hurt you anymore. I don't even know what this place is. I mean, look at it. This is a joke, right? This is like Yasser and Patricia having the last lap. I mean, Look at this place. At least they're together. They were always together, and it's all they had, Sarah and Amina. We know the truth, and the truth is coming out. That's what you wanted, and you kept him safe. You did what you said you were. And now it's our turn to do whatever we can for you to have your story told. It's very heartbreaking. I'm sorry you have to be here. We miss you too, Sarah. What a waste. I don't know how you, actually I do know how to pull it back, I've done it. No, before. no, don't do that. I won't, don't worry. I know you're scared. Just sit right there and give me this moment, please. It's times like these that bring me to my knees. I need you to hear me, please, girl. Just say it.
if I told you today I just wanna blow you away tonight I don't wanna say goodbye I just wanna lay here in this moment And feel like I own it tonight I don't say goodbye I wanna hear your voice as you whisper a little while longer I'm reaching out I wanna feel your touch The way you look at me it's all too much I need you to kiss me and tell me you're with me tonight I know I'll cross this line What would you say if I told you today I just want Just trust in this moment.